Uh, buenos dias, everybody. It's great to be here. Well, first of all, I have to thank the SAR and all the staff and really everybody at the SAR who I have engaged in conversation with. I've been learning so much from all of you, and this is it's just a, a fabulous place to meditate and write and, uh, and just learn from everyone and, and all the new faces. I'm, I'm very honored that you're all here today. So today I'm going to talk about Mexican Nazis and global pachucos. Uh, and you see some of the, the photographs that I'm using already introduce that topic. On the, on the left, you see what it appears to be a mestiza wo woman, a Mexican woman in 1935 uh, during Hitler's birthday, uh, saluting, you know, doing the Nazi salute. In the middle is an example of what I call a global pachuco. He's a Zazu. He's a French... Uh, suit suitor. And uh, on the right is the Mexican Nazi movement, the Dorados, they call themselves. And uh, they had an important base in El Paso, Texas. The U.S.-Mexico border was a very important base for the extreme right-wing movement. Um, my first book was about the incredible importance, the centrality even, of the U.S.-Mexico border during the Mexican Revolution. Most revolutions will, will start in the center. The Mexican Revolution was the first major social revolution of the 20th century. But it wasn't like, say, the French Revolution that began, begins with the storming of the Bastille in Paris or the Russian Revolution, where you have the major centers be the place where they start. The Mexican Revolution, actually, its major leaders come from the border, whether it's Madero, almost all of them except for Zapata. Of course, Villa, Obregón. And... During World War II, a lot of the same people that used to be involved in the Mexican Revolution, using El Paso, as a, El Paso and the entire border as a very strategic base to carry out mostly a, a liberal or a leftist revolution against Porfirio Diaz, the dictator of Mexico, back in 1910, they come back two decades later, and now they have fascist ideologies. And so my talk is mostly about a hidden war during World War II, uh, what the Japanese call Shisosen. While most of the major battles were taking place in the European or the Japanese or the Asian theater, um, there was a different kind of war, and it was what Shiso thought, Sen, war, a war of thoughts. Uh, the Germans called it Weltanschauung, right? This, this clash of master narratives. Now, I take a a different approach to most of what has been written about this. I call my method global microhistory, and, and you know, I don't want to get in too much into it, except that my thesis is in the method. And what do I mean by, by global microhistory? Well, it, to some extent, it's about zooming in in a, a small space, small geographical uh, location, and then zooming out and seeing how these small pace, spaces have all these kinds of global trajectories. And they, they lead you to unexpected um, uh, observations. So let me give you an example of what I mean by zooming in, zooming out. This is just a, a picture that I found <coughs> in a Bowie High School yearbook from 1940. Now, Bowie High School, uh, in 1945, it was described as the, back then, they were called Spanish-American uh, students. They had more Mexican-American students than any other school in the United States. A lot of them were children of the Mexican Revolution. They came from refugees that, that came into El Paso during the Mexican Revolution. And so I find this a very uh, interesting example of a cognitive map of these Mexican-American students. And you see, maybe it's not that easy to, to see, but you'll see a you know, kids playing on the football field, there's ROTC marching, there's people doing target practice, uh, there's a shop building on the bottom, um, uh, boxing. So it's a, it's a clear, you know, I, I see it as an example of what uh, Edward Soja, geographer Edward Soja, calls the um, innocent spatiality of social life. You, there's not much that appears to be that important there, except it's 1940, and kind of the campus seems to be pretty militarized, right? Everything, even the shop during the World War II, 
will become a place where uh, Bowie students in the metal shop are producing $1.5 million of uh, empty artillery shells for practice at Fort Bliss. Everything becomes militarized. But it's not that simple to kind of uh, see it from there. You know, and so these are some photographs of Bowie High School in, in 1940. Already you see keep them flying. Already you, see, you already see how kind of the, the consciousness of the war kind of permeates everything. So when they're, they're learning English, they're no longer just learning literature. They're learning you know, all, the, all this terminology that will be useful for them in, uh, in the army. Everything, everything becomes part of the war curriculum. And if you look forward, you blow it out, right? All of a sudden, you see bear tracks around the world. So these are buoy uh, students. Of course, the, the buoy bear is their mascot. Um, and you see some buoy students stationed everywhere, up in Alaska, up in, you know, down in Australia, of course, in Japan, and even Iceland. This is from 1943. So in three years, you see kind of the globality. You see how you get the small scale and then the global. But microhistory, I'm basing it a lot on uh, Carlo Ginsberg. When he describes microhistory, it's a, it's a different evidential paradigm. It's about um, seeing clues where others might not see them. Uh, a Sherlock Holmes, right? You might, something that other people throw away. So let's go back to, to this first image. So over there where it says girls field house and all that, you see a guy smoking, right? If you look carefully, he's wearing a zoot suit. So that's where I get my evidential, my, my little clue that leads me to a much broader expanse. You know, that most people would have probably missed that, right? So this is where my narrative starts. 19 with the pachucos. So who are the pachucos? They start from, they're, they're a group that would hang out in, in the 30s. It's actually a, an anthropologist by the name of George Baker that wrote a book in 1950, it's called uh, Pachuco, uh, Spanish-American Arga, and he traces their origins to the El Paso border back in the 1930s. Even according to one of his informants, he has the exact same street, and it's Florence Street, Florence and 8th Street. So the Pachucos, were usually dealt you know, by, by the media at the time and sociologists as juvenile de delinquents, et cetera. He saw them more as kind of examples of globality in a strange way. What do I mean? Well, their language itself was not just the local jargon, you know, local slang. So let me just give you an example of, of how they spoke back then. And I know a lot of you speak Spanish, see if you can Keep up with me, I guess you can follow in English. Nelese, pues si no voy a ese vengo el paciente. Ves un lugar que le dicen el paso. Más que allá vienen los pachucos como yo, eh. Me viene acá losca, me viene a parar garra, porque aquí está buti de aquella ese. I won't go on, but how many of you caught 100% of that? <laughs> Maybe a little bit, right? Well, aquí tenemos a, al doctor de la Madrid. I'm sure you did catch 100%. But this is how it sounded back then. And this is from one of the... Pachucos that comes from El Paso that perhaps prom uh, promotes this kind of Pachuco lifestyle during the war. He's the first uh, Latino artist to sell more than a million copies. His name is Edmundo Tostado, Don Tosti. And this is what he sounded like. So this is from the 1948 album. Boogie, Boogie, que el alve el buggy, pachuco buggy, pachuco buggy, pachuco buggy. Ese donde la lleva pues, ese, pues si no voy a ese, vengo del paciente, ve, es un lugar que le dicen el paso, nomás que de allá vienen los pachucos como yo, ve. Me vine aquí a los cabe, me vine a parar garra, porque aquí está bote de aquella ese, aquí se pone bote alerta todo, ve. Oiga, sabe, vamos a dar un volteón ese. Vamos y nos ponemos bote tirili. Y luego, ah, mano, pues qué suave se venga. Porque quiero que me cante, ve, quiero que le haga bote al alba, ve. Órale, se cánteme una cancioncita ese. Nos ponemos bote alerta ese. Cánteme ese. Suénele, viejo. Suénele.
puede estar más tile que nada de ese, porque le suena a usted de aquí ese gato. Simón ese, ¿sabe qué? Ya me agüité ese. Vámonos al rol. Vámonos al rol ese, ya me quería me cantón. Al rol ese vato ese. Ya, ya por derecho ya. Al rol ese. Ok, so I, I think you get the, the, uh, the sense that it's about a lifestyle, what they're talking about. And jazz is the underlying uh, foundation of what they're saying. There's other ways in which the Pachuco Caló is a, is a global language. A lot of the words, like chavo, boy, lima, shirt, dando, hat, gacho, it comes from Gitano, or, or the Roma Gypsy language. From Nahuatl, you know, chantli, that, that means house, right? As takuchi, to bind with cloth. Archaic, there's a lot of archaic New Mexico terms, like fregado, that's the Pachuco slang for broke, aguitado, sad, jalar, work, borlote, dance. So the question is, you know, what, what happens? These kids that are hanging out in El Paso Barrio, how did they get to be so global? Right? That's one of the questions that I ask myself. Of course, um, six months before the LA riots, and this was in the summer of June 1943, so in, in January 1943, all of a sudden the El Paso police get a report, a call from the California police saying, we have heard that the Pachucos are collaborating with Axis agents. Please conduct the raid. So massive raids were conducted in El Paso. And the media, it was a media campaign. They were called the Youthful Terrorists. And they were searching every pool hall, every street corner for Pachucos and any kind of evidence that the Pachucos were in collaboration with basically, they were looking specifically at uh, this collaboration between Mexican Nazis. Uh, sinarquistas, as they called them, or uh, as they, they accused them of being Mexican Nazis, and perhaps they were right, uh, but they found no evidence of this kind of collaboration. Now, when the suit suit riots happen in Los Angeles, that attracts global attention. So you would, there were a lot of radio stations, uh, shortwave radio stations aimed at Latin America. So Axis agents took advantage of the suit suit riots and the mass roundups to portray the United States as hypocritical in its relations with its own ethnic races, as seeing, you know, they're rounding up the Mexican American youth and they criticize us for rounding the Jews, things like that, right? So it becomes a, a global issue in that way, in terms of the propaganda. There were other ways that the Pachucos were global. Stintan, this was one of the more popular comics in Mexico, one of the most popular comics in Mexico at that time. Supposedly, he kissed more women actors than any other Mexican actor of his day. So that was Tintan. And of course, we know that the suit suit, uh, the Harlem, the jazz scene, they all were Dexter Gordon, uh, Cap Calloway, so many of the, uh, of the major jazz musicians at that time, that was their outfit. And then you had these guys, the Zazu, that used to hang out in Paris, um, also wearing the same thing. They loved jazz. And uh, at first they were seen as kind of an apolitical group, but during the Vichy, uh, the Vichy government, uh, you had a lot of them actively resist the French collaboration with the Nazis. Some of them were thrown into concentration camps, but, and sometimes they would use these, these Star of David's swing Sasu, in identification with uh, the Jews of their country that were being rounded up by the Fiji government. And then you had the Schwingjugend. Um, Schwingjugend was a, a play of, on words on the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler youth. So you had the swing youth that were listening to what was considered by the Nazis uh, entartete music, uh, degenerate music, the music that was mostly Jewish music or, you know, what they called Negroid music. And so just to listen to that music and to wear the outfit was in itself a kind of cultural resistance to the Nazi government. Schwing uh, tanzen verboten. It is prohibited to dance swing. So there was a lot of, kind of um, underground cultural resistance that later became um, uh, a political resistance. The, the biggest example, so, so the swing jugend and the wearing of the pachucos was mostly in Frankfurt. Um, 
in Berlin, of course. Uh, there were some places in Köln. Um, and so you have here uh, a group of young kids that were considered kind of juvenile delinquents in, under, under the Nazi regime as well, that call themselves the Navajos. And as you know, the Germans have this great appreciation for all things Indian. You know, uh, Hitler's favorite, uh, as many of you know, Hitler's favorite author was Karl May, who was a kind of Wild West author of the time. And so these, what I would call the German version, the Pachucos, calling themselves Navajos, turned this kind of inchoate cultural, countercultural resistance into actual resistance. Many of them killed one of the chiefs of the Gestapo. So on this occasion, six of the, these youth were hung as part of a, uh, of a raid that, the, uh, that Himmler ordered, uh, public execution for, for their actions. So you see the globality there, that, just to give you an example. But how about this idea that the Nazi, the, I'm sorry, the uh, Pachucos were collaborating with the Sinarquistas. So the Sinarquistas uh, began in 1937, and they were mostly a, 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 an organization that was created by the Catholic Church, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church back in the mid-30s, and most of them were leftovers from the Cristero War. The Cristero War had been a long war of resistance against the government's attempt to eradicate Catholicism from public life. And they created this organization that began mostly along the U.S.-Mexico border. Why? Because I said a lot of the former, say, Maderistas, revolutionaries, had used the U.S.-Mexico border as like the ideal place to wage uh, a revolution against the government of Mexico because of the smuggling. It was a good place for propaganda. There was, you could hide and it was still near. There were a lot of reasons. It, it had to do with, I guess, the control of flows. Of, there were so many reasons. So they started organizing all along the U.S.-Mexico border. There weren't that many in the United States. There were probably about 5,000 of them. In Mexico, there were uh, 500,000 by 1943. And a lot of them were, um, so according to a 1943 report by the uh, Office of uh, Strategic Services, the precursors of the CIA, there were about 500,000 pro-access anarchistas in Mexico, and, oh, I'm, and 2,000 in the U.S., I'm sorry. The, the Union Nacional Sinarquista was allegedly funded partially by the Nazi, Japanese, and Falangist agents. El Paso served as uh, regional headquarters for groups along the border towns. So you see a lot of the, and a lot of them are indigenous women from central Mexico doing um, a salute that was very much influenced at the time by the Hitler salute. They would later, uh, you see them in prison as well. You know, um, some of their leaders would, would write books later that saying, yes, we were very much influenced, especially by Franco, because Franco was seen as a defender of the church. And uh, at the time, uh, Pope Piacelli, um, was, well, signing concordats, both with Hitler and with Mussolini. I mean, this is a complicated story. A lot has been written about it. But in a very general sense, I think the Catholic Church was willing to collaborate with fascism, uh, whether it was Franco, Mussolini, or Hitler, in order to defeat communism, because communism was a much greater threat. And so this, this happened in Mexico as well. So... This is one of the uh, allegations that you find uh, in the OSS reports. Uh, this is from uh, the National Archives. We say, if unchecked, the Union Nacional Sinarquista will inevitably attempt to overthrow the Mexican government. The UNS encourages Mexicans in the United States to resist assimilation and is laying the groundwork for an irredentist movement. The last analysis, the Sinarquist movement, must be considered a threat not only to the friendly and allied Mexican government, but also the, to the tranquility and security of the United States itself. Sinarquista propaganda is carried on by a well-developed machine, probably the most effective that's ever existed in Mexico. It has organizational contacts, advice, and financial aid from access organizations, including the Spanish Falange. So this was the, this was the threat that led to those original raids in El Paso seeing if there was any kind of collaboration between the Pachucos and the Sinarquistas. So, I mean, if you go to the archives anywhere, 
I've had the opportunity to uh, spend a lot of time, of course, in the National Archives in Washington. Uh, as part of my Fulbright, I, I spent um, eight months in Mexico City um, looking through about 20 different archives. I've been to Berlin as well to look at those archives and uh, London. And you find a lot of these kind of documents that, as you see, uh, the Nazi parties on top. This is the outline of access organizations in Mexico. Then you go down to the political. You see the Spanish Falange are in control. Then you see the Partido Nacional Socialista Mexicano, the Mexican National Party, the Sinarquistas, and Acción Nacional. So Acción Nacional is the PAN, right? The second major kind of political party in Mexico. And then the PAM, which are offshoots of what I showed you, the gold shirt. These are some of the files that you find in the FBI, kind of outlining Japanese espionage and propaganda activities in Mexico. So, I mean, I, I've collected thousands and thousands of these, these kind of underground narratives of uh, a huge fascist movement in Mexico, a lot of it on the U.S.-Mexico border. So these are the gold shirts. The gold shirts were led by a former villista. His name was General, um, Nicolás Rodríguez. And uh, during the, the government of Mexico, uh, of, of a Mexican president, uh, Lázaro Cárdenas, they attempted a kind of coup. Uh, they were rabid anti-Semites and anti-communists. Um, and so Cárdenas basically uh, expels the leader of the gold shirts to El Paso. And he later uses El Paso as uh, a kind of an underground base of operations to uh, conduct to plot the overthrow of the Mexican government. So this is Nicolás Rodríguez. Uh, and so once again, he was connected with the German-American German boon. Uh, these are all allegations at this level. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the veracity of any of this information. Um, so they're connected to the German-American boon and the silver shirt movement. So um, the silver shirts is especially... Uh, under the direction of uh, one of the, their, their founders, Henry Allen, was supposedly trying to, to arm the Yaqui Indians in Mexico as well, as, as well as uh, kind of providing support for the Mexican gold shirts. In El Paso, there's, uh, this, this is one of the documents that I found in the uh, Mexican security, um, the Secret Service files in Mexico City, there were, there were meetings between Jose Vasconcelo, the representative of the Pope, one of the, like the, the underground leaders of the Cristero movement, and uh, Marcelo Caraveo, also a former revolution, and Cleofas Calleros, who was uh, a Mexican-American leader, a very active activist in the Catholic Church, that all three were uh, supposedly collaborating out of their headquarters in El Paso in Florence Street the same street where the Pachucos uh, rose from, right? So I found that kind of geographical spatial connection very interesting. So these are just some of the intelligence agencies that were operating along the U.S.-Mexico border. So you had the FBI, of course, the Special Investigative Services, the State Department, uh, Military Intelligence Division, Office of Naval Intelligence. And so you, why would the Office of Naval Intelligence be in the middle of the desert in El Paso, right? Because... By then, all of them, especially the top three, the FBI, Military Intelligence, Office of Naval Intelligence, they were all conducting mostly, I guess, homeland security espionage, right? They, a lot of times, especially up to like 1939, they were more interested in suppressing kind of radical movements that they were really in suppressing, you know, Nazi spies, etc. So all of these, I, I won't go through the whole list, but there, I mean, El Paso and Juarez was like Berlin during the Cold War. It was just full of these kind of intelligence operatives. And this is one of the, uh, one of the main uh, examples of, the, uh, of a report that contains all kinds of allegations of invasion plots that are going to come through the U.S.-Mexico border during the 40s. And it was published, uh, Mexico, Totality and Activ Activities, Mexico Today, 1942, published by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And you see the map of all the places where the Special Investigative Services of the FBI uh, had their headquarters. Um, so there were all kinds of 
allegations of border invasion that to us now, I mean, they're obviously false, obviously just exaggerated. One of them um, was a reliable report that was given to the Military Intelligence Division. This was in the summer of 1940 where the Battle of Britain is, is going on. That supposedly 10,000 German pilots were hidden all along the U.S.-Mexico border ready to invade the United States. This was considered a reliable report. So if you think about it, during the Battle of, of Britain, I mean, uh, you know, the Luftwaffe had these 2,000 pilots that were just getting shot down. Could they have risked, you know, 10 pilots along the U.S.-Mexico border? Maybe. You know, 100, oof, highly improbable. 10,000, that's just like absolutely ridiculous, right? So this is, this was part of um, something that um, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt would receive. He would, all these glossy reports of all these incredible threats that were gonna come through Mexico. So this one is the Republic of Mexico planned for the German invasion. It's hard to read, but basically, it's how the Germans, that the Japanese were gonna take some German pilots close to Baja California, or parts of Peru, and they were gonna attack San Diego, one of the, uh, uh, so this was, when you see them, and this is like something, like a several hundred page report, I mean, I get scared, I'm going, oh my God, this is terrible, you know, this, they are gonna invade us, because the drawings are so nice also, right? <laughs> so this is a Republic of Mexico, plan of Japanese invasion. So according to the FBI, there's a, there's a very good, chances Japanese are gonna attack Acapulco. From Acapulco, they're gonna go all the way to Laredo and invade the United States. And so these were all like considered, you know, highly uh, reliable reports. Republic of Mexico, potential enemy airfield. So these, all of these were actually in the, um, in the uh, FDR library up in Hyde Park, New York. And once again, I mean, literally hundreds, maybe thousands of these records. There was also the allegation by the Office of Naval Investigation that the Japanese were transporting opium through El Paso and Juarez in order to carry out a kind of um, genocide through, through drugs, right? So this was a narrative that they were gonna pass opium so that you can demoralize the enemy, which is what supposedly they were doing in, in China once they take over Manchuria, that they poison the Chinese people with opium, and that they later are gonna bring them to the United States to demoralize, say, the Fort Bliss soldiers, all the soldiers stationed all along uh, the US-Mexico border. Like a fascinating narrative. So of course, I've looked into it. Is there any kind of uh, basis and truth in that, right? And with all these kind of conspiracy theories, like, how do you check on that? I mean, unless I go to Japan and find where the Japanese says, yes, we were passing opium through El Paso and what is, like, how do you verify this? And this, so this is one of the questions that I pose as an historian, you know, to what level are these allegations? Let me, I'll go back to that. This is another allegation that I found really fascinating. Um, and it has to do with border avisadores. So border avisadores, um, Along the border, there was communi communication, especially between the Yaquis. They were the ultimate trans transnational tribe that were north of the border and south of the border. And they would communicate with each other with supposedly, well, no, for, in, supposedly in 1940 for other reasons, but that, I mean, that's a known fact that they would communicate with mirrors, re with reflections, and hat, hand si uh, signals, hats. And a lot of times, say for instance, in 1915, they would use it um, south of, uh, like in South Texas, to talk to, to communicate about the Texas Rangers, for instance, or to warn each other much later about the Migra, the INS patrols, the border patrols. So supposedly, again in 1940, according this was according to a military intelligence division uh, um, reports, the Yaqui Indians were collaborating with the Japanese, the Germans, and the Italians, and they were using this the indigenous system of, uh, uh, of communication to pass on information about um, train movements, you know, U.S. essential information for the, for the access. So that's, all of these are, are just part of, uh, of these allegations that are going on, how Mexico is this incredible threat 
you know, this porous place where there's this threat of invasion. Now, what's interesting to me in my thought, like what can be verified and what can't be verified? Well, I mean, if you, if you go later and you read the writings themselves, so there's all these allegations that, that um, certain people are Nazis or not Nazis. Well, there's some, not all propaganda is based in absolute falsehood. There is some truth. So the allegations, for instance, that Jose Vasconcelos is a Nazi can be verified, absolutely. I mean, you have pictures of him with Arthur Dietrich. He was the, um, uh, he was the press attaché of the German uh, embassy in Mexico City, and they were paying him um, $600 US dollars a month, the equivalent of that, back in 1940, to publish uh, Timon, which was a German propaganda uh, magazine, right? Uh, $400, I'm sorry, 6,000 pesos. <coughs> And then you have the military intelligence division reports claiming that the PAN is, is promoting pro-Franco Hispanidad ideologies and are an important political branch of the Nazis in Mexico. Now that one's a little harder to prove, but I find evidence that a lot of uh, their publications do have pro-Nazi sentiments, even though the PAN is, is very smart. For instance, they have two different magazines. One of them is very Catholic, very tempered in its rhetoric, and that's La Nación. And you see, for instance, the themes that they're talking about here, it's called Penetración, uh, Bautismo Evangelico. They're, they're talking about Protestant penetration of their country, right? Uh, cultural, religious uh, uh, imperialism, right? And of course, you see the obvious, the, the, the white Baptist minister kind of very seductively, you know, uh, baptizing the Mexican woman as kind of a threat. But La Reacción was more of a, an underground. They were the same writers of the PAN that was just openly, openly pro-Franco, pro-Mussolini, and pro-Hitler. And you see Aquiles Elordoy, one of the PAN co-founders of La Reacción in 1941, making statements such as these, where he denies being a Nazi, but it's not a very convincing denial. As a Mexican, I'm very interested in a German victory. To begin with, Germany provides an eloquent and clear example of how a nation can become great through order and discipline. I'm not a Nazi, nor do I have any illusions about totalitarianism, but since there is no freedom nor democracy in our country, I consider Nazism, despite its negative qualities, a necessary stage for us to go through in order to become a true nation. So this is one of the major founders of the PAN saying this. Um, and here is celebrating Hitler's birthday in Mexico City, 1937. So, you know, when I look at pictures like this, I always ask myself, like, what are they thinking, right? I mean, how can you be a Mexican, a mestizo, and be a Nazi, right? That just seems like such a contradiction in terms. And, you know, what I found, and this was one of the surprising things, that somehow indigeneity, either it's um, rejection or it's affirmation, oddly enough, is part of what it means to be a Mexican Nazi. So, for instance, the affirmation. This was something that, as you saw, like Nicolás Rodríguez uh, is in direct communication with Arnold Krumheller, who is one of the Nazi agents that's trying to promote Mexican Nazis. And he said, Mexicans and Germans belong to the same race, not only because the Spaniards were Goths, but because the Toltecs originally immigrated from the north, just like the primitive Germans. The first Aztec Indians had blue eyes and blonde hair, just like the Goths. It was the Moors who immigrated to Spain, and interfered with the Spaniards who brought their dark skin. Right, so this idea of somehow uh, indigenous people in Mexico not only being honorary Aryans, but in a sense, real Aryans, right? Because they shared the common Toltec roots, according. But then there was also the, I'm sorry, the rejection, right? So the, so the panistas, you had people like Mejia being very much a proponent of Hispanidad. And Hispanidad was the ideological counterbalance to U.S.-led Panamericanismo. So Hispanidad was following the, the, the kind of the Catholic example. Uh, Spain was going to provide spiritual unity, especially now under Franco's governance. Um, so you have people like Mejia, one of the founders of the PAN, saying, we are against indigenismo from two sources. First of all, from the communists, because you have people like Diego Rivera that are using indigenismo to kind of promote these ideas of 
equality and you know, racial democracy. But we also don't like that kind of indigenismo that comes from the United States, because you have all these examples of you know, our in indigenous art, native uh, art exhibits in the MoMA that are just a way, a very subtle way of Amer American imperialism coming through Mexico, because you have all these tourists, anthropologists going down to Mexico City and studying the, you know, the Aztec ruins and what have you, as, as an excuse for uh, cultural, political penetration for imperialism, right? So this, these were the pan ideologues that were saying why we are against indigenismo. Oddly enough, to fight the communists and to fight U.S. penetration. Um, there was the, Jose Vasconcelos had very similar ideas of not completely excluding uh, native people from the idea of mestizaje, but incorporating them and bringing them up through what he called aesthetic eugenics. So this idea of a kind of a hegemonic mestizaje that was also opposed to indigenismo was part of what it meant to be a Mexican Nazi. Oddly enough, this, this very contradictory movement. So as I thought of all these different things, you know, and all these kind of conspiracy theories, I, I came, you know, it, it seemed very odd to me that like people, for instance, like uh, Colonel Donovan, who was the head of the OSS, was also the head of propaganda, and what he called black propaganda. White propaganda is like the voice of America that, that you admit to being, you know, that the United States is promoting this information. Black propaganda where, is where you pretend to be somebody else, and you're spreading uh, propaganda under the disguise. So I always found it very curious that intelligence was very strictly connected, very closely connected with, uh, with propaganda. So I, I started kind of, you know, looking at things in that direction. Definition of propaganda from the OSS, Morale Operations Field Manual, very quick definition. Propaganda is the deliberate direction or manipulation of information to secure a definite object. It is a new dynamic for society. More can be won by illusion and suggestion than by coercion and terrorism. And the contents of propaganda may range from absolute truth to selection, distribution, have truth, to complete falsehood. What is appropriate in order to secure positive action, to illuminate the techniques of propaganda, is to reveal the secret springs of social action. So propaganda, what, why is the border important to propaganda? Uh, Hitler kind of explained a lot of it. I mean, he was the master of propaganda. Mein Kampf is like, uh, I hear that Donald Trump had it in his, from a Vanity Fair article in his bedside reading and that he really admired some of these techniques. It is a mistake to make propaganda <coughs> many-sided, like scientific instruction, for instance. The receptivity of great masses is very limited. Their intelligence is small, but their power of forgetting is enormous. It must confine itself to a few points and repeat them over and over. Here, as so often uh, in this world, persistence is the first and most important requirement for success. All of us know that repetition is essential in propaganda. At first, the claims of the propaganda were so impudent that people thought it insane. Later, it got on people's nerves, and then in the end, it was believed. And this is what I really feel that is, is part of, of examining the border. It belongs to the genius of a great leader to make even adversaries far removed from one another, one another seem to belong to a single category. Because in weak and uncertain characters, the knowledge of having different enemies can only too readily lead to the beginning of doubt in their own right. Hence, a multiplicity of different adversaries must always be combined in the eyes of the masses of one's own supporters. Uh, the struggle is directed against only one enemy. So the Jews, of course, were the typical internal enemies and external enemies, because the Jews stabbed Germany in the back, according to Hitler, and they were also somehow involved in all kinds of global conspiracies. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and they were behind all the communist movements. So it is that conflation that takes place between the internal and the external enemy that, I, that, that gave me clues on how to understand propaganda. Nazi propaganda in Mexico, again, under Vasconcelos. I found this very fascinating that there were a lot of articles that just <laughs> were aimed to produce anxiety, like they had nothing to do with any kind of political statements. And so this was one, you know, written by, under uh, Vasconcelos' direction, Mexico invaded por un ejército de millones de ratas. Mexico is invaded by an army of millions of rats. 
Mexico, especially our capital, lives under the constant threat of an invasion by thousands and thousands of rats. Those sickening, repugnant, and despicable little dark bodies with shiny, malevolent eyes who attack and devour everything that they encounter as they migrate through the streets, right? I, I won't read the whole thing, but this idea of rats migrating, coming in, penetrating, right? That was part of the psychology where you don't appeal to the rationality. You appear to fear and anxiety. The Germans um, had this idea of Einschaltung, where everything becomes part of the discourse. Uh, it's hard to read, but one of, you see trains coming in from the borders, and it has to do with a delousing system called Cyclone B back in, uh, this was from uh, 38. And there's an example up here where it says, Begasungstunnel in El Paso, where um, a German uh, scientist that owned the patent to Cyclone B was looking at the uh, El Paso example of how, beginning in 1929, whenever Mexican migrants had to cross to the US-Mexico border, they were deloused and their clothing was deloused with Cyclone B. And, uh, and so this was, uh, an ad for Cyclone B. We are um, embargoing, closing the borders to the immigration of dangerous pests. Right? So this idea in the language of these dangerous pests coming in, which was part of you know, these ideologies and this propaganda becomes actual, you know, it, it gets put into practice. These are some examples of braceros on top coming in 1942 and being sprayed on the bottom directly with DDT in the face, right? But it's all part of this idea of protecting ourselves, the, the body politic of this country from these dangerous pests, which was not only in Nazi Germany or in you know, Mussolini, uh, Italy, but it was really kind of a part of a global creation. The conflation of the internal and the external enemy was a global phenomenon, I would argue. So people fight back against this uh, propaganda, right? So propaganda and intelligence to me, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm going kind of fast because I, I want to give us a chance to uh, engage in some, some dialogue afterwards, but um, propaganda to me is about the management of affect. So you produce anxiety and these fears of of threat for several reasons. Now, all these con kind of conspiracy theories that you see in the FBI books, there's a lot of reasons. They're not all calculated. One of them was, for instance, most of the FBI agents that operated under the SIS did not speak Spanish. So a lot of times they, def they depended on translations. They would hire what were basically uh, informants that were professional informants. They would tell them whatever they wanted to hear. Right? And they would late, make, late, make lots of money. So they would go to the British and tell them something, and to the Germans and sell them some information. So all of that garbage appeared as part of the reports. There were also political objectives for having so much information. Of course, Roosevelt, at that time, like in 1940, he desperately wanted to get uh, the United States involved in an alliance with the British. So it was in his interest to believe some of these maps that showed the invasion of the Germans through Latin America and through Mexico. So there's political agendas, there's just mistakes, there's sometimes, and I found evidence of people that were actually just, I mean, it's hard to tell, but from their stories, they were just clinically paranoid, right? There, there were these, a tendency for paranoid people to work in the intelligence field. But what I find is that it's a very conscious thing that is going on in the intelligence as well. And it's this management of affect in order to justify the, the millions and millions of dollars during World War II. Say, for instance, the OSS begins with uh, a $10 million budget in 1941. Five years later, it's quintupled. Same for the FBI, same for almost every um, intelligence operation. So it's kind, it becomes a kind of um, self-perpetuating mechanism. Like today, after 2001, the United States has spent more than $6 trillion in its anti-terror 
activities, right? It becomes a kind of, it needs to feed itself. I've, talking, I've talked to some border patrol agents in, in El Paso, and they say, you know, last week we only had like 14 Mexicans cross over uh, from, from Mexico to the United States. We're bored, like we don't know what to do. We play our guitar, right? <laughs> Yet, you hear this idea of SIS, all these terrorists that are gonna come through the border. You know, this great, this production of anxiety that serves to justify not only political campaigns, but the anti-terror surveillance, heavily militarized uh, regime that is part of the U.S.-Mexico border. And that's what I'm trying to do, is understand kind of the techniques of the management of affect. How you produce terror, but also kind of turn it down when it's in, 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 when it's in your interest. So these are examples of the uh, coordinator of inter-American affairs, kind of promoting, you know, kind of turning down the, the, the hysteria against Latinos in the United States by showing, you know, the, the Mexican Rosita Riveter and by showing the participation, uh, the, the great participation, and, and in that case in, in, in New Mexico, New Mexico had the largest participation of uh, Hispano, indigenous volunteers in the army, and of course they also had the largest casualty rates in the whole country. So they would promote these kind of things. Of course, you had the kind of the United, this was a, a huge binational solidarity parade where um, Mexican workers, everybody united. They, suddenly, the people that were seen as a threat, as a potential you know, communist or, or, or all those people that had been deported during the 30s were now seen as soldiers of production. So once again, the management of affect. You need to calm down the anxieties. You, you turn down the volume. And these are pictures by the Office of War Information. The braceros were these dirty you know, people that needed to be sprayed because they were a threat to us. And all of a sudden, they become these, her these heroes you know, that in, in this global battle against fascism, waving the victory sign. But it, going back to the pachucos, it was the countercultural kind of just identification of themselves and, and, and that was part of a global phenomena that was somehow not completely drinking the Kool-Aid. There's agency in fighting all these ideas of these border people that are not accepted by either side, you know, challenging the narratives. And this was something that I found really interesting. 1937, Bowie High School, the high school I started with, they held a, a strike. The kids went out and they carried a, a, a bottle of milk in one hand and a loaf of bread in the other. And they just, they skipped school <coughs> because the El Paso Herald had written a, a, a very uh, negative uh, portrayal of them in order to bring attention to their plight. And, and they wanted to, uh, they were saying that the Bowie High School uh, football players were starving in the cafeteria out of hunger. Please, you know, help the, the Bowie kids by contributing to their uh, food fund. And they were really offended by this portrayal of themselves because they said, you know, this is depression. Other people are facing this, but they're not all targets to this kind of humiliating uh, portrayal. So they staged the first walkout of a Mexican-American school in the United States in 68, 69, I believe. There were the Los Angeles walkouts, 2006, the anti-immigration walkouts. But this was the very first one, and it was the we are not hungry strike, you know. It was a dignity strike. It was a contestation of the negative portrayal of what it means to be a fronterizo. So another example of where, in order to understand one little street, one little area, one neighborhood of the world, you really have to understand the whole world. Thank you. Thank you.